back to Liminal Frames. I'm your host, Nathan, and I'm here with my co-host, Exo Academian. Uh, you're listening to episode five of the show. Exo, do you think we'd make it this far? I did. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, the reason why I put like three digits, 005, because I pictured us getting to episode 100 one day, and that way we wouldn't have to change the number of digits in the titles. Uh, nice. But uh yeah, happy to get back into it, and we've got another uh, loaded and fun topic to uh, to unpack today. We do, yeah. This topic uh, so fun and packed uh, that we uh, have trouble even categorizing it. But I think we're going to give it our best shot. Uh, we've talked a lot about on the show, uh, you know, even the name of the show itself, Liminal Frames. It, uh, one of the goals of our show is to take topics within uh, the phenomenon, the ufology, the paranormal, and kind of walk through ways of examining those topics uh, from from different vantage points. Um, and I think that's incredibly useful uh, just as a general tool, not, not just for this subject, but for anything. But it's also something that I think our listeners and, and ourselves personally can directly relate to. We all bring with us to experience our own perspectives, our own frameworks of understanding and when it comes to the phenomenon, that's no different at all. And so we, what we want to do in this episode is kind of look at, and, and I think even validate the, the, the different ways of approaching uh, and different ways of framing uh, our experience of the phenomenon and our experience of really life itself. Uh, and so I know that's pretty, pretty broad and vague, but uh, hopefully it'll become clear as we walk through it. Um, Exo, when you think about, uh, you know, kind of stories of the phenomenon or high strangeness, uh, you know, it, what are some of the uh, on ramps for you uh, into approaching the, those stories? If you were to break down into kind of different kind of categorical uh, uh, models, you know, how would how do you, uh, you know, turn your attention and kind of walk through and work with the things that you experience in, in those stories and in the data that you that you see? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that what we're trying to point out tonight is that we have these pre-existing frames. We all do, whether we're conscious of them or not. Um, and uh, that has as much an impact on our takeaway regarding when we look at data to do, to do with the phenomenon as it does with the the actual data itself. In other words, interpretation is always part of the exercise. Um, and it's interesting because, for instance, on a platform like UFO Twitter, where we're both pretty active, you know, you see different groups uh, there that are pretty distinct. And someone might come away without realizing the sort of the framing piece and go, this is so strange. Like, how can there be these polar opposite different perspectives here? Um, and of course, it comes down to number one, this data is hard to digest and parse anyway, because you've got high strangeness, you've got, you know, uh, precognitive sentient phenomena, you know, as, as John Alexander coined it. So you, you've got um, your cause and effect and all that kind of stuff is thrown out and your, even your expectation of what can happen in reality is thrown out. So already the data itself is really tricky to, to sort of tease apart and you can't put it through your usual uh, kind of cycles and you can't recreate it in a lab very easily. So probably more so than any other topic, um, people's presuppositions really weigh heavily on what they come away with here. Because some people will look at one part of the data and say, there's just no way that can happen, like mm -hmm. a priori. So therefore it didn't happen, right? Someone else might say, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical. You know, I, I want to see evidence before I'll say something happened, but I'm also not going to deny it, that it's possible, right? And then you get someone who's actually personally experienced it that says, there's no question here. There's no debate. I went through this. I don't need you to tell me it's real. I experienced it. Mm -hmm. So you've got this range and it is such an interesting topic because, again, the presuppositional you know, framework we bring to it has as much a role as anything in what we take away, and probably with this topic more than any other. Completely. 
uh, I think we're going to, you know, sort of tonight, we're going to kind of champion uh, all of those perspectives, you know? So, you know, when you talked about UFO Twitter, uh, it came to my mind, you know, it, it's, it is not, it's, it feels like not a week goes by where there's not some sort of, uh, you know, kind of beef that, that someone is having with another person. And, and it's, I think it's helpful to remember that it's not, necessarily personality driven it is the it is kind of based on these uh frameworks of of understanding uh that 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 just as you articulated you know most folks kind of plant themselves in a particular uh, spot when they're approaching everything that kind of comes to them and they're you know and we are going to be just defenders of those positions we have built up these walls that we, you know, we have fortified and they help us navigate uh, our day-to-day life and help us make sense of the experiences that we have had in our lives, both the mundane experiences and the phenomenal. So this is uh, something that we live out uh, every single day. uh, And then we take that with us into these conversations. So I want to start, you know, as we kind of, we, we have, I think, uh, hinted at the spectrum, I want to go through it. So if we were to start, uh, if I were to say maybe on the left side of the spectrum of, uh, of understanding, you know, we, we can talk about the, the, the qualities of those that are what we would call maybe believers or even experiencers, as you pointed out, those who've had a firsthand experience of something. Uh, what... In when you're kind of reading people's reactions or takes on certain things, what what are the highlights to you of a person that uh, you know really is kind of firmly in that camp of the believer? I think many of them, there has to be a, a personal piece. Either they themselves experienced something, or they know someone that did. Uh, only because. Again, it's so much outside of the norm of what's the accepted consensus reality of what can happen that uh, that to get firmly planted in that category of believer, uh, usually there's something pretty personal there that's happened. Um, some people, the rare people like a Jacques Vallée, maybe just the sheer weight of the data itself, you know, like and not just reading you know, dry books or something that are cataloging experiences, but him actually getting out in the field and interviewing witnesses and seeing that these are professional people with good reputations who have families and jobs and responsibilities like everyone else. And he sees how they are fundamentally changed by these experiences. Um, He becomes convinced over time that there's no way that that's being made up. And many of these people would rather it have not happened to them, you know, and I know that personally, some of the cases I've researched, people basically did everything they could. Uh, they looked at every other alternative as opposed to this being real to try to make sense of things. You know, people who would rather have had literally a psychologist declare them mentally unstable or they have some sort of chemical imbalance, they need some drug to manage. Some people would rather go there than actually believe this really happened to them. They got abducted by aliens or something. Um, so yeah, for the, for the, the strong believers, it's either personal experience or they are uniquely qualified to objectively put aside all presupposition and just let the data itself speak to them. Someone like a Jacques Vallée, um, you know, in that recently in a podcast episode, I talked about their six layer model, Eric Davis and Jacques Vallée. And they, they sort of throw critique at both ufology and mainstream science because both, from their point of view, um, tend to skew the data. Either they, they say this can't happen in the mainstream science perspective, so it, it, why would I even bother looking at it? And then you've got ufology that kind of like uh, pigeonholes it into saying, as long as this fits the extraterrestrial narrative, then we're good with it and everything else we'll kind of ignore and suppress. Whereas what Valet did was say, no, this, this is in the data. Like it it's repeatedly shows up time and time again. I'm going to be convinced by that, uh, especially because he met so many of these people firsthand. But with believers, definitely the, the actual experience comes into it centrally. 
Right. And, and there's a quality uh, that it is felt uh, kind of viscerally as well. That's what I associate with uh, belief. In, in my own experience, um, growing up in a Christian tradition, you know, belief was, it, it had a relationship with, with knowledge and learning but it was also something that was deeply felt that was intuited or, or, you know, subjectively, uh, you know, kind of verified. And I think that that's a, when I think about belief, at least it, it, there, that's a quality of belief that just, you know, always kind of comes to mind because of that uh, personal experience that, that I have had, that it's not necessarily a, um, a relationship or a perspective uh, with uh, facts per se, as it is something that I have lived or, or you know, felt in my own being to be true. Even with the example of Jacques Vallée, uh, you know, collecting and, and researching so many cases and encounters and experiences, he's always, you know, showing up to the scene after the, <laughs> the crime has been committed. He's, he's arriving after the events have taken place. So he's getting just relayed information. And it's, the, it's that sheer sort of volume of relayed information that ultimately I would imagine tips the tide in the favor of, uh, you know, there is some truthfulness here to this that I can't ignore, but I, I have not myself experienced it, but I, but it's, it's approximate experience now that is uh, in a sort of too, too large or becomes uh, in a way, almost becomes consumed by the person that investigates it, uh, and then digested, you know, <laughs> in that in that process. So, you know, I think belief, to me at least, has a very, uh, you know, sort of physicality to it, strong physicality to it. Um, I don't know if you would, you know, sort of echo that perspective or or not. Yeah, I think I think that's true, and I I think it's it is helpful to think about different ways that people sort of ascertain knowledge. You know, sometimes it's sort of a, a left brain objective, you know, show it to me through the scientific method. But and in many ways, our culture has kind of been biased towards that. There's a strong prejudice towards that, even though when we're honest with ourselves uh, and you can even see it borne out in the data when it's when it's actually studied, we make decisions constantly based on gut instinct and things like that. And we have these vague terms like gut instinct or intuition or feeling. Uh, but what we're basically saying is there is another side to knowledge, another side to reality that we're mo motivated by that doesn't fit in those those easy categories. Um, so yes, I think sometimes it is very visceral. Uh, and again, when people say they feel it in their gut, they use that expression, I think, because that's what they're saying. It's not like some sort of cold, calculated, you know, um, parsing of data. It's more like something rises up, like you say, physically in them, a heat they feel mm -hmm. that makes them feel invested. Um, I think the other thing is important to point out about this, this believer side, sort of, of these three different groups, right? Believer, skeptic, denier, or debunker. The, mm -hmm. I would also say that it's important to point out that we want to sort of be fair to everyone here, which means mm -hmm. we want to be fair with our... Um, our glowing uh, praise as well as our critique, right? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the believers, you've got everything from the people who actually are just attention seekers, you know, the people who basically want the limelight and will play things up. You've got everything from that side of the spectrum to on the other side of the believer spectrum, someone who this is their worst nightmare. They would not want to be associated with this. They've always, maybe even some of them been anti-woo-woo, right? And yet they have an experience that they they can't see any other way. And so even amongst, we're talking about the broad spectrum, right, of perspectives, believer, skeptic, denier. But I'm saying even within each of these, there's a spectrum, especially in the believer category, because you've got some people who kind of are just kind of, that's kind of their inclination. And other people, it was absolutely not their inclination, but personal experience forced it upon them. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Every, I'm trying to think of how best to phrase this, but we are so, I think, uh, primed or conditioned to uh, 
approaching any kind of knowledge from the standpoint of uh, like the almost like an equation or a variable in the equation that 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 you know we will stake out that position or that ground. It will be a static thing that is obtained and that it is not fluid in any way, shape or form. It is, it is, you know, it is a unit, uh, a, a kind of unit of knowledge uh, or a, unit, a, a, a perspective that is, uh, that is incredibly uh, solid, non-permeable, uh, non-changing, you know, that that's who we are. We are not people that live in flux. We are people that have positions and that have uh, philosophies. And those things are incredibly uh, uh, sort of either sound or, uh, you know, inherently coherent. Uh, We'd like to believe at least that they are inherently coherent. Uh, You know, there's no discordance there in the things that we have come to hold to be true. But the the reality is that that all of our, uh, all of our perspectives, every day, every moment of every day, are going through a, a sort of uh, sort of transitional uh, you know experience uh, you know we and and I'm, I would hope when it comes to this topic that as we uh, you know are digesting new bits of information and I would hope from the purpose of this uh, episode as well that we can recognize when we walk through, these kind of different modalities and also celebrate them. And, and as well as, as just as you pointed out, uh, be, be in a position to critique them. Um, and, and maybe that is a good sort of uh, transition to spending some time talking about the, uh, the kind of the, the center point here of the spectrum. And that is the, the position of the skeptic. You know, this is someone who, uh, you know, I typically associate with, uh, a person who may want to be a believer, but just can't get there uh, and is going to withhold their judgment until they have uh, more, you know, sort of proof, for lack of a bit better term. Uh, they want sort of objective data. I, would, I think there are a lot of folks in uh, the kind of UFO circles that, that are skeptics and they, they really do. They have been uh, animated by the idea of UFOs, but cannot themselves commit to a particular, uh, you know, sort of uh, statement uh, of fact related to the, 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 the topic. They want that data. They need that proof. And until they get it, they're just going to sort of sit on the fence uh, as, as long as possible. I have to tell you, I personally identify with that, you know, it's uh, because I am not myself an experiencer. Uh, I think that's where I kind of feel the most at home and, and kind of comfortable uh, because I, I I worry about over committing to something that I have not had direct firsthand experience with. But I don't know. What, what do you think about when you think about those who, you know, really fall into that skeptic category? Yeah, I think that that's a loaded term skeptic, you know, or skeptical. And uh, I would say even just like with a believer group, even within the skeptical crowd, that's quite a range because you get some people who sort of are more being uh, true to the spirit of the word in the sense of they're not saying they don't believe it or they do believe it. They're saying that they are waiting for persuasive evidence. So it's it's really meant to be a neutral position based not on emotion and that kind of mm-hmm. visceral feeling, but based more on something objective and calculated like data, right? Um the challenge, though, I would say is that, again, like I mentioned already, this phenomenon kind of uh, does away with our usual expectations about how data is supposed to be amassed and and how phenomena is supposed to show up. And so if you go in with a really rigid perspective on, look, if it falls in these categories, then I will be persuaded. I, my skepticism will be, will be uh, you know, dealt with. But the challenge is you can't do that with this phenomenon, that it, it's its most perplexing aspect is that it, it, whether you want to say it's some sort of conscious trickster element that deliberately confounds our attempts at trying to get clear data, or it's just the nature of it itself that the way it interacts with our space-time construct, uh, it comes in in, a, in an obtuse angle, and so it just ends up 
rendering really strangely in terms of our perception. And again, even there, what we perceive versus versus what's really out there is a, a whole nother question itself. So the skeptical crowd is interesting. And I, and I think also I would, I would encourage people who do sort of take on this moniker to be clear on what would be persuasive to you. And, and uh, especially with this particular uh, data set, because it is so tricky. For instance, I see, sometimes see people show up and say, and you kind of have to learn this through the school of hard knocks, will show up in social media, like places like UFO Twitter, and they'll say, I, I'm looking for, and I had this happen recently. Someone said, I'm looking for, you know, credible evidence to support remote viewing. And from my point of view, there's plenty, like, there's been a hundred years of parapsychological research now that's undeniable. And, and so I pointed out to this individual that not only is there a lot of good data, but even the CIA funded a program with SRI, Russell Targ, Hal Putoff, people we've talked about before, that ran for 20 years straight. And I said, the CIA does not fund programs for 20 years if it's not producing valid intel, especially in the midst of the Cold War. And his comeback was, oh, the CIA absolutely will fund ridiculous things. I've seen it time and time again and blah, 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 blah. My point being that I don't think he was actually, in that case, an individual looking for data. He wasn't looking to be persuaded. He basically was coming in with a position, uh, a presupposed position, and pretending to be a skeptic, willing to look at data objectively. Mm-hmm. So you, you kind of have to, you know, look out for the wolves in sheep, sheep's clothing in this field, because you will get people like that who basically are out to debunk. And the, and you have to get good at recognizing that person is open to having a conversation and open to being persuaded by data. Other people will sound like they are and are not. So the, the line between the skeptic versus denier or skeptic versus debunker is sometimes a tricky one because uh, it, it sounds better. It sounds more objective. It sounds more neutral to show up as a skeptic. But sometimes people who who wear that moniker are actually more like a debunker, and they've they have very hardline um, categories about what can happen. And since the phenomenon seems to confound those, they are out to basically do away with that annoying data that doesn't fit their pre existing categories. Yes. And, and I think, too, there's a sense of self-preservation that is tied with that uh, skepticism uh, that, um, you know, look, none of us want, want to be wrong. None of us want to be uh, made a fool, you know, and if you've ever been made a fool, uh, if you've ever been made you know, to feel wrong, it's not a good feeling. You know, so that the bad feelings stay with us pretty strongly. That that's part of our survival uh, drive. You know, to remember what what hurts us and feels bad, and and avoid those things at all costs. And so we we take that as a uh, that experience, you know, in, in, into the way in which we interact with the world around us, and we we create a shell that prevents us from over committing to something. Uh, you know, otherwise we risk, you know, kind of being made a fool, being, being vulnerable, uh, being hurt again. So it's, it's very much that kind of protective, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, reflex. Um, and, you know, again, I, I do identify with it and, and I wonder, uh, you know, I do wonder to what degree my religious upbringing, you know, plays a part in, in kind of my comfort level, with that particular category, you know, sort of coming to a place in my own life where uh, the truths of my belief, you know, no longer sort of rang true. And I was, I sort of had a sense in which uh, it had been a fool's errand, you know, to place belief in, in those things. And so, you know, don't fool me once, right? <laughs> Shame on me. Uh, or what, you know, I never know that phrase, neither does George Bush. Bush but, uh, you know, that's the, uh, the sort of position there. Um, and then I think that that does bleed into the, uh, the qualities of the, she said, the denier, the debunker, and that that protective mechanism is is on, you know, sort of extreme display, you know, it's, it's, um, I, you know, it's that sort of, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I'm not going to let anything 
kind of come into this inner space, I have already staked out my position. And no matter what you put forward to me, I'm going to hunt down uh, the things, the items that only buttress what I've already concluded. And that is that you're wrong. Um, and that, that, that feels pretty good. If, if you're good at that, if you've kind of made that your landing spot, uh, you know, you're going to feel, I think, a strong sense of, of, of um, purpose and power in the act of committing to that process over and over again. In fact, you're going to look for, and this is what we see in the behavior too, you're going to look for opportunities to do that. And, uh, and you're going to uh, kind of take delight in opportunities to exercise that uh, tendency that you've, that you've developed so strongly. Yeah, several really important points in there. I think, uh, again, we're, we're getting back to this visceral aspect again. Um, you'll sometimes see people who, again, will sort of posture themselves as if they are cool and collected and, hey, man, I'm just all about the data. But number one, like you said, <clears throat> some have a vested interest in protecting a certain position, even if they're not either being honest about it, or they may not even be self-aware about it, that that's what they're really doing. Mm -hmm. They may have convinced themselves um, that they are all about objectively evaluating data. And yet what you'll sometimes notice is when there's increasing um, amounts of data challenging their current position, they'll get more and more heated and you'll, you'll notice them even getting defensive. Mm -hmm. And that is a clear sign that they're beginning to experience cognitive dissonance, that they are being confronted by data that data that does not fit with their, their preconceptions. Um, and that's why we get so many heated debates uh, in, in the UFO Twitter land, because um, people have a vested interest. It, it we are not robots, right? We don't just look at data and, uh, you know, ascribe identity in one set versus another. We have very visceral reactions. And when our very worldview, our very way of making sense of why we get up in the morning and what can possibly happen to us that day gets challenged, very few people are prepared to handle that well. Um, and on top of that, you know, the, the mainstream scientific circles have kind of become the modern day priesthood. We've talked about this before, right? So they kind of have a, a position of entitlement that they're not even, they feel so comfortable in that position that they really believe that centuries and centuries and centuries of investigation have already made it very clear that their position is correct. That even when they're coming in saying they're skeptical and they're willing to consider different positions, Really, they're coming in more from a defensive posture of saying, sure, I'll use all the right language, but listen, we know what's real. Right? We've already established that over the last several centuries. We don't need to go back to the church. We don't want to go back to some sort of spiritual woo-woo stuff. So let's let's be clear. Let's look at evidence. Let's make sure we can study it scientifically in a lab and make sure it's reproducible. If it's not, it's not real, blah, blah, blah. So we also have to deal with that too, that... Um, a lot of the skeptics are coming from that sort of mainstream position as well. That, uh, And it's very difficult. It's a rare breed to find someone who's equally skeptical about the current mainstream perspective as is someone who's skeptical about something they consider woo-woo. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. in other words, skepticism should be neutral. And yet, in reality, it's often not. In the same way that, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages or whatever, it was very difficult for uh, skeptics to believe that Galileo was right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the same way today, when mainstream science, you know, has the four, it's, it's very difficult for people to um, really position themselves to be skeptical about that because the bottom line is, again, this is visceral. Belief systems do come in. We'd like to, as human beings, even though we constantly trade one worldview for another over the history course of our history, we, we very rarely, in fact, we've never gotten to a point where we said, listen, we've learned our lesson. The key is to not be, you know, too concretized around one worldview. So we're going to sit back and we're not going <laughs> to do that. No, that's not what we do. We just adopt a new one over top of the old one. And we basically often sort of cancel out the old one and think everything bad about it. 
and think the new one is is fresh and golden and sweet smelling. And, uh, you know, sort of the modernist materialistic perspective probably had the greatest sway in like the 19th century. But it's still very strong today, even after all the revelations that have come out of quantum mechanics and whatnot. And so, again, a lot of the skeptics that show up are, are coming from that position of entitlement that mm. they represent the establishment as it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's funny because uh, as you're talking about, I, keep, I, I apologize to our listeners. I'm going to keep coming back to using my children as an analogy, but I think we've all been children. So I think we can relate to this too. Uh, but I, you can map onto this spectrum, the, the, the human development, right? So, um, from believer to skeptic to, to denier, uh, you know, which is another very strong word to use. And we can kind of come up with other words there other than even debunker. But if you follow me through this, when, when we're young, we, our default position really is very much kind of a, a, a faith, you know, sort of trust uh, in, in, in our parents and in the world that they are portraying to us that, that that's the way things are. I don't, I don't have a way of my, of my, uh, that I can myself verify, you know, sort of what, what is true or not. It has been mediated to me from my caregivers who, who, you know, meet every need that I have and, and why would I not trust them? So, th so the belief begins at a very young age and then inevitably, uh, as, as we all have had an experience, some of us have an experience uh, sooner in our lives than others, but inevitably, those individuals let us down. You know, those uh, caregivers will, will fail us in some way. It may be a small way or a big way, but failure it is. And we will, that, that, that solid, strong belief that we had in, in, in what made sense now starts to have a crack and, and kind of, you know, is shaken. And then that, that transition that you see happen often in, you know, kind of young adulthood, uh, teenager years, you know, it, you're, you're learning to kind of figure out what is, what is your truth. You're going to, uh, you know, sort of be a little bit on the fence about what you are told. Cause you know, again, you don't want to be hurt. Uh, you don't want to overcommit, uh, to someone. And then as we get older and we see this happen, I see it in my own life. The older I get, you know, the more uh, I kind of instinctively react to things that are different and want to, uh, you know, say, well, no, it's not that, you know, uh, it's actually like that. It's only this. Uh, I know you think it's like that young people, <laughs> uh, but it's not, you know, and I think that that, so that's only natural through our lived experience that, you know, that we kind of arrive in, at that place. So, so even physiologically, you know, these uh, sort of modes are things that I think we can relate to uh, just in our, in our lived experience. Uh, and, and, you know, on that note, and I've already talked about my own sort of uh, comfort level or, or position of comfort on this spectrum, uh, even though I, I have found myself at the other places as well. But EXO, you know, I know we've talked about this a lot in our private conversations, you know, you've certainly been through all three of these uh, sort of areas in your own life. Yeah. And I think that um, we, we've talked before about once you've been through one or two worldview shifts and you've experienced that cognitive dissonance, um, you, you hopefully hold your most recent one a bit more loosely and not so mm -hmm. tightly. Um, and but nevertheless, it's never a good feeling when you start noticing there's mounting evidence that your way of seeing the world is insufficient, or especially if it feels starts to feel wrong, misguided. Mm -hmm. That's not a good feeling. You, you know, you sort of think about someone who has to retrain for their career, like halfway through their adult life. It's not a good feeling. Most people have the energy and the wherewithal to do that at 20, you know, not so much later in life. In the same way, Yes, getting back to your point, the older we get, the more in some ways rigid we are. Um, we have more experience behind us, so we're more convinced of the way we've seen things. And it's it, it becomes more and more difficult for us to stay flexible and malleable. Um, for me, yeah, when I look at these three, first of all, I would say with the believer part, I've definitely had... Uh, some of my own experiences, which I've shared at various places, including on Point of Convergence. And I think when I talked to you guys on CAB as well, 
um, had that experience of things that are not supposed to happen. Like I'm, I was, I think I was very left brained at that point. And, um, you know, I had a certain idea of, uh, what could or couldn't happen in reality. And yet I had an experience of something that was not supposed to be one of those things. And so you're confronted with it. And, you know, on top of that experience, it was someone else too. So I know it wasn't just bad pizza or my own delusion. If it was delusion, it was a shared delusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were physiological effects and whatnot that showed up as well. So, um, you come away going, feeling this cognitive dissonance because you go, wow, the data, I have a really hard time dismissing here. Like uh, I would have rather written it off as as a weird dream or something, but it wasn't a dream. Um, and it, it wasn't delusion. Um, so you are confronted with, okay, I have to create a new category now. And that's not a fun feeling. It really isn't. You, you um, again, we have an emotional attachment to our perspectives and we... Uh, the same way it's a shock to the system when we find out Santa Claus maybe isn't what we thought he was. Um, in the same way, even more so as adults, we are less malleable or more concretized with all the responsibilities we have to juggle. It's not a good feeling when your very understanding of reality is questioned. Um, so I've been through that personally. Um, so that definitely changes my perspective. Uh, I can know what it feels like to, I mean, thankfully I've never been around people who, uh, you know, would mock me for having that experience or anything like that. I've never been around that kind of crowd of people. Um, but I know people that are, and I see people who suffer because, um, people basically ridicule them, mock them for even claiming to have such an experience. So that's how I sort of got to the believer part. Um, but I should also say when I, I, I still bring healthy skepticism to that believer aspect though, you know, like I, I see some people, uh, on UFO Twitter, for instance, I think make this too black and white. They, they try and make it too binary. You know, it's like you're either 100% in the believer camp, you know, the experiencer camp or you're not, what's it going to be, you know, tell us right now, <laughs> you know, you're in or you're out. And I, I just don't think that's, uh, a helpful, fruitful, or realistic way to look at it. You're still going to have the spectrum of people, everything from people who are absolutely truthful and would rather this not have happened to some people who have fanciful imaginations and maybe are looking for attention. You still have to accept that that will be in there. Part of the reason why I land firmly in the, uh, I believe the evidence suggests something is happening en masse to a lot of people is because of the sheer numbers. So partly what I do there, and sometimes I'll have so-called so skeptics say to me, oh, so you just accept every, every you know, circumstantial case, every hearsay uh, account as real? And I say, no, I don't. I assume actually a certain percentage of them are flat out false. What I'm saying is when you have that much data, like that broad a body of data, you can say 10, 15, 20% falls through the cracks as a misidentification or fraud or whatever exaggeration. But you still, even after you know, building in some pretty healthy filters, you've got just a, a huge amount of data saying something really is happening. So that's the way I personally apply healthy skepticism, I think. And you, you come away looking at the totality of the data. I say this all the time. You know, we have to look at the totality of the data. And what I mean by that is you allow for all those different aspects, those different filters, and see what you're left with when you do allow for some of those cases. Um, and I would also say, too, that I, I there was a period in my life where I was pretty, um, you know, rigidly modern uh, and physicalist in my perspective. And you might have called me a denier, you know, like I, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I remember when I was younger being around people who claimed to be seeing things. And I just assumed like, if I can't see it, and if somebody else in the room here can't see it, it can't be real. Like at that point in my life, I assumed that anything that was quote unquote real, um, by definition had to be perceivable by everyone there. Now, we know the phenomenon constantly challenges that assumption, right? That you'll have um, people that know each other well, even either see, like in my case, you know, 
uh, I saw something slightly different than my wife saw. You know, even though we saw basically the same thing, there were some subtle differences. But some people will say, look, do you not see that UFO? And, and then someone will say, no, I don't see anything. What's there? You know, and, and, and yet we see that happen time and time again. So that's when the whole question about is this being projected into individual consciousnesses or, you know, into our perceptual apparatus or what's going on? I think it's even more complicated than that. But again, it comes down to the presuppositions you bring in. So like I said, at one point in my life, I would have said, if something's real, everybody there has to see it. Now I would absolutely say that's not the case. The phenomenon confounds that assumption. But again, I'm I'm sympathetic to those who have a hard time seeing that because until you've had an experience like that or until you've become really familiar with the data, that is the the you know, the supposition that exists in our in our mainstream society. Yeah, and I, I was thinking too, like when I went from when I left the kind of believer phase you know, I didn't go into the skeptic phase. I actually went right into the denier phase. So I, I, I didn't um, kind of gradual, gradually take that path. I actually took the opposite. Um, and that probably is fairly common uh, to have that journey uh, either way. You know, so if you're a believer and that belief has been, uh, you know, sort of shattered, uh you know, you've been confronted with uh, something that you can no longer ignore, you know, as again, that defensive mechanism, you know, your tendency will be to, to take the opposite approach. So I, I certainly did uh, in my life and, and went from, you know, kind of being open-minded about, uh, you know, people's experiences that they would share to kind of taking the position that you articulated that, you know, if it's not something that most people are having, or that we don't have, uh, you know, sort of a photograph of, or, uh, you know, some other, you know, data that we can look at, then it's just something that happens, you know, in, in your mind, it happens, you know, you, you imagined this, uh, you know, out of whole cloth. Um, and I th so I think that that's you know, a fairly common step to take. And then, and the opposite is true as well. So you could be in the denier camp, you know, a, a sort of very, staunch, you know, sort of, uh, modernist, you know, and have an experience that you can no longer deny, uh, and, and it confronts you just as profoundly, uh, if not more perhaps. Um, and so you do have that, uh, you know, sort of ontological shock and you go right into that believer camp pretty quickly. Totally. And I, I when I think about what you just described there, a couple of things come to mind. One is that I think you would probably admit that part of the reason why you had such a uh, massive shift, basically going from one pole to the other, is because when you again have that feeling of being lied to or feeling like a fool or, you know, whatever, you retreat to a safe position, right? And mm -hmm. so suddenly going from believing some things can happen to then feeling like evidence is mounting, suggesting that was all a farce. The safe position, I'm talking about emotionally, right? Not mm -hmm. objectively, but emotionally, the safe position is not to move to the center and say, okay, I'm going to go right at the 50-50 line and wait for mm -hmm. evidence. What we do is to protect ourselves emotionally, we go right to the other pole and say, none of this is real, prove me wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's on you uh, to prove me wrong. So there's that part. But I think another part that for me really was a wake up is that when, we, when we're when we young, we tend to think that the consensus reality, what the mainstream power sort of put forward, has really been objectively and fairly discerned, you know, mm -hmm. over many, 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 many years, decades, centuries. And so we have a really, the same way like you talked about our parents, right? We have that initial trust in our parents that everything they say is golden and why would they ever deceive us? And uh, we, we also sort of take that view towards societal powers. And so I think even many people right now have difficulty accepting the reality of the UFO phenomenon because they don't see widespread acceptance or acknowledgement amongst the powers that be. And so they, for some people, that creates cognitive dissonance. That if, if this is really real on the level you're talking about, why is this not headline news or being talked about by our politicians, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think... 
one of the shocks to my system was realizing that there's very much a lack of objectivity behind the consensus position. And when you get to a certain period in time where something's been the consensus position for a long time, like we have right now with like a rigid, rigid modernist kind of physicalist perspective, that what really counts as real is, is matter and energy, things we can measure via the scientific mm -hmm. method. Everything else is kind of mushy and not real, subjective, right? These are bad words, slurs almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you, you, uh, but I found that actually that the system as it is, as is always the case in every era in society, is actually set up to defend that position, not to try and accurately fairly gauge all possibilities, but actually there's a vested interest in the same way that you had a vested emotional interest in protecting yourself by swinging to the other pole and saying, I'm not going to believe any of this. We as a society do that too, because we as a society, as a collective, like to feel like we know what the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. It's not a good feeling the way that we've been raised anyway in our society, maybe less so in shamanic cultures, but in our culture for a very long time, uh, we, we believe in rationality, you know, um, and we believe that when we approach the world with certain um, ways to gauge it, to measure it, that it's going to always return absolute predictable results that we're pretty sure we know what they are ahead of time. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, that was a big part of it was recognizing you kind of have that uncomfortable moment where you recognize, okay, if the consensus sort of powers that be are either not being honest about this or they don't even have the capacity to because they're blinded by their own prejudice, what else are we not being honest about? And what else mm -hmm. are we not really engaging with in a, in a truly fair and objective way in the way that we claim to be? So that, 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 then you have a sort of a two levels of it. You have your own emotional trauma around things happening, perhaps that you couldn't understand. But then you also recognize that the powers that be actually have a vested interest in protecting a current position rather than really evaluating from a fair point of view. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, these outer sort of states uh, do in fact mirror our inner states, right? So that's uh, something we've talked about in the past as well. As as we accumulate more experience, you know we have a, an inertia that uh, you know is 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 built up, and that's incredibly powerful. Um, and you know, in a way, it kind of takes on a life of its own. And I think you alluded to this, you know, just sort of societally, you know, that that we are born into a structure, a world where there are a particular set of facts uh, and that has existed before we were here, you know, we just sort of appeared on the scene and, you know, are going to absorb, you know, everything that is in that mix. Uh, you know, and I think if we look through history, we're going to see uh, mirrored in historical movements uh, the same kinds of modalities that we've already talked about, you know, so a period of human history very much centered on uh, belief, you know, on uh, a, a system of beliefs that, you know, very sort of viscerally felt, not uh, necessarily objectively uh, analyzed the way in, we, in which we would consider that to be done today. And those belief uh, structures and mythologies you know, became challenged, you know, became uh, no longer functionally valuable. Um, and once they lost their uh, sort of power, their narrative power uh, over, over the lives of the individual, then you saw this, you know, kind of proliferation of alternative ideas uh, of, of uh, you know, sort of a plethora of emerging mythologies uh, that existed in, in society uh, that, that challenged that sort of old conventional thinking uh, and then in that mix of, of different ideas, you know, you, you had sort of gave, it gave, ultimately gave birth to the modern world in which we live, which has shewed all of those things. So you can see just right there kind of a, uh, you know, in a, in a very, you know, kind of simplistic overview, uh, the path that we as, as human civilization have taken through these uh, ways of understanding uh, what 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 is true, 
Um, and it's it's very likely that that we are going to continually move through these different phases, uh, not only in our own personal lives, but in our lives uh, as a collective. And I think that that's an important, uh, you know, sort of point to highlight because we are, anytime we are going to be grappling with uh, something that is going to potentially shatter the paradigm of our, of our conventional understanding, uh, we need to be prepared for the fallout uh, that, that occurs in the wake of that impact. And I think we could pretty fairly say that, uh, that you know, human civilization being told that we are not alone, you know, that we are not the only kind of type of intelligence, that there's a, you know, there are other intelligences on par or maybe more intelligent than we are. That's a pretty profound, uh, you know, paradigm shifting moment. We are going to then have to grapple with all of the downstream consequences because that will absolutely shatter our notions of, uh, of truth. It will, it will absolutely shatter, uh, our, you know, kind of, um, modernistic kind of worldview. We're going to have people that will uh, jump right into the belief camp, uh, you know, and believe, you know, whatever uh, that, that it leaves open that door in a way. It's like, well, if that's true, then what else is true? Anything is true, you know? So I, I'm going to believe it all now. Everything that I've ever heard as being, you know, fantastical, that also must be true. Uh, and then similarly, you know, folks are going to, uh, look at that with a very skeptical position. Uh, you know, I, I, and that, and that, and that too will be impacted by just the ways in which the message is, is, is provided. And, you know, we've talked about this some too, but there, you know, how do you, I feel like we're in a unique position now in history where we, we are really struggling with, uh, coming to a consensus on what is true. And so how do these different sort of approaches uh, and different perspectives, you know, how do they work their way through uh, what is being told to us and, and from whom it comes from, you know, because it's no longer traditional. It's no longer just like, well, I read it in the newspaper and that's, you know, I can, I can agree. My neighbor can agree. We're on the same page here. It's, it's we're going to be entering, we already are entering into a different uh, sort of way of understanding what what is true. Yeah. And when you were talking there, I was thinking about Thomas Kuhn and his um, his definition of the, the structure of scientific revolutions, you know, and he, mm. he kind of challenged this notion that we um, that science sort of is about the steady progression of the accumulation of new ideas that science basically is just an additive process that moves in one direction in, in a steady way and fine tuning along the way. That is, that is actually not what has happened historically. What happens is you have a certain dogmatic perspective, even within science, which is not supposed to be dogmatic, but it certainly is just like any other strong um, identity system, right? And initially when data comes forward that challenges some of the existing scientific perspective, it's usually ridiculed uh, at first and, and kind of made fun of because it's almost like that, come on, we all know that can't be true. So why are you even bothering telling us about this? Then it gets to the point where as the evidence grows more and more, you will actually find it becomes almost violently opposed. That's the word, he, the, the phrase he uses is violent opposition. Now, on the one hand, we might say, why would anyone get violent about ideas? But of course we do mm -hmm. as individuals and as a collective. Uh, again, we have a vested interest in feeling like we know what's going on. And before you can even adopt a new perspective, you have that uncomfortable in-between zone of, I don't know what the heck's going on and what counts as real. No one likes that zone, some, some more so than others, but most mm -hmm. people do not like that feeling. And that's why you get the violent opposition because it's, it's, the, it's the final stand, so to speak, of the, the previous guard saying, this is the way we've always seen the world, and I'm gonna. I'm, this is the hill I'm gonna die on to say this is true. Now, what's interesting is is the third stage is um, that the new perspective is accepted as self-evident. 
That's so fascinating to me. It goes from violent opposition to self-evident truths. Uh, so I think we always need to remember that, that, that mm. we've been through this before with our collective society and we will go through it again. The revelations coming out of the phenomenon absolutely are one of these scientific revolution moments where um, you will get people who will almost violently oppose this. Uh, and on top of that, you've got the added piece of, of the sort of people coming from a, a really fundamentalist religious point of view who they are convinced it's angels and demons, mostly demons. And so mm-hmm. they will uh, think that even to talk about these things is to give power to that, right? We've talked about this before. So mm-hmm. you get, you've got some very strongly embedded vested interests not interested in, in acknowledging this phenomenon whatsoever. And that's why you get the bizarre scenario we have now where so many of us are aware of data that's staring us in the face and yet it's not being talked about. Uh, I think, again, for anyone who's come from sort of the modernist sort of mainstream perspective that you think that that's a valid way of seeing the world and it's been tested and proven and you take you take as self-evident that the current powers that be have done all their homework. They know all that mm-hmm. stuff. So that's why we can grow up and accept what we're taught in school. Then you get to a point as an adult, especially when you've been confronted with data, for instance, in the UFO phenomenon, where you realize that's not the case, that there are absolutely things that are happening in our world, in our reality, that are not talked about because the consensus reality has a, an unspoken data set that you're allowed to draw from, and it's taboo to, to not. And that's why ever since 2017, the revelations that came out of those New York Times article has been about... Uh, uh, the l- first few years is trying to just trying to get past this, the, the, uh, this, you know, snide remarks and the X-Files music, mm. because none of that of course is based on an evaluation of the data objectively. It's based on the presupposition about this. We know this is silly, you know, tinfoil hat stuff, uh, flat earth kind of thing. So we always need to remember that, that as much as we'd love to next week, have you know the today show have a segment where we see joe biden or some other political figures maybe together saying it's time to come clean this is what's really been going on that's not how these things work they work themselves up from the ground up actually and we talked about this a couple episodes ago how this tends to happen with our governments versus the populace and and what gets proposed as a belief system and and often you actually have to have an intense upsurge from the grassroots, so to speak, from the people and a lot of lobbying, but before you actually get people to even listen to your argument from an object- objective point of view. So mm-hmm. that's what's happening here, I think, is you could argue that uh, the people on the scene, like the Lou Elizondos and the Chris Mellons of the world, are out there trying to lobby to make this, to normalize this as a topic. That's primarily what they've been doing is just trying to normalize it get on every network they can, every show they can, every podcast they can, just to just to create a situation where you have a, a sheer repetition of this message. So people begin to subtly shift towards being open to objectively analyzing the data. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm saying here. You have to go through that entire process before people will even be ready to look at the data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I want... Um want our listeners too to understand that this is not, uh, I think it's easy to approach this topic and, and our discussion of it from the vantage point of, oh, you know, that sort of EXO and Nathan just kind of really just playing with words here uh, as we, you know, talk about this issue and that we're, we're in a way almost carving out a position uh, for ourselves that is, uh, you know, to a certain degree neutral. But I think what we're advocating for is really looking at each of these positions, these different frameworks and saying they are each valuable. They are each bringing to the table uh, to to whatever may come out of, you know, the, the channels of disclosure. You know, they're going to bring something important uh, to to that revelation. Uh, that that it's good to be a believer sometimes. It's good to be a skeptic. It's good to be a denier. These are all uh, normal, 
healthy and necessary uh, sort of states of being with respect to not just the phenomenon, but lived experience, period. You know, so, uh, you know, if you are a healthy uh, person with any lived experience in your, at all, you know, you should be able to pick up the tools of these different modalities and be okay with, with, with finding yourself comfortably, you know, within the parameters of, of the, of the, those modalities themselves. Uh, you know, I, I want to say to those that are in that believer camp, you know, that is valid, valuable, and, and, and good, you know, so it's, it's important that you, I think, uh, you know, kind of share that experience with, with people that you try to, you know, articulate why it is that you do believe uh, and, and, and be okay with that. And don't feel that you have to be necessarily apologetic uh, for that either. You know, we do live in a culture that, you know, I think does kind of reflexively look down on those that, that believe, uh, you know, but I would sort of challenge uh, that perspective uh, for a variety of reasons. And those that are skeptical, you know, it's important. Uh, it's important to be skeptical of what you hear, um, of what you've been told, of, of kind of where information is coming from. You know, we all should be able to sort of don that hat uh, and, and kind of suss out what it is that we uh, are, are hearing and looking at. And then the denier stance, look, it, if we didn't hold strong positions, even, you know, pre preconceived positions, uh, you know, we would be so uh, malleable and gullible and foolish that, you know, we wouldn't make it, quite frankly. You know, there are, uh, there are very good reasons why, you know, we have kind of generational knowledge that, uh, you know, for the most part has, has kept us safe. Uh, you know, through through many different adversities, and I would think that uh, I would I would you know be grateful uh, for those that you know kind of have have gained that kind of place of wisdom and are comfortable uh, you know defending it uh, even in the face of uh, you know a challenge to that to that perspective. So you know, it's really kind of taking all these things together and being able to sort of flip through them like a deck of cards in a way, or, or you know, different lenses that you wear and, and say, you know what, what rings true after, after going through this? And I would think that you'll find, and actually I'd love to hear what you think about it. If after going through those steps, you'll find that there's something true in each one of them. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think I would also say that when you brought up the the category of believers and the, you know, the conception, the notion of belief I think it's definitely important that we point out that those who come from a uh, a reductionistic, materialistic point of view, that's as much a belief system mm. as is someone who believes that we're being visited by non-human intelligence of a sophisticated nature. I think that's the first thing we should clarify here, that um, sometimes those people coming with that perspective, though, will either not acknowledge that or they will not even be self-aware of it. Because again, that's mm. the power of the consensus view is that you ha- you're kind of blinded to your own crap and and you uh, that's just g- par for the course. I- I'll be honest and say that, you know, the Mick Wests of the world kind of can drive me a bit crazy, partly <laughs> because of the, um, the, the, <laughs> the sheer gloating nature of, you know, he just assumes that he's coming from the correct perspective and He'll often, I think, you know, will will be so convinced that he's coming from the correct perspective that he will put forward, for instance, his his uh, analysis of a certain event, even over experts, expert witnesses, pilots, and whatnot, who've spent their entire career training to, for instance, recognize enemy aircraft and whatnot. They've done it for decades. They do it instinctually at this point. And yet he thinks by analyzing a video, you know, he, he, a grainy video that he acknowledges and kind of makes fun of being video, a grainy, that he can come to a, a more accurate conception than they can because he has so much belief, so much dogmatic belief in his presuppositional framework. 
that's what I think is really important to point out here. It's not that he's convinced that there's A, B, or C options, and I think all the evidence is on A. It's more that he believes that we have a uh, century's worth of um, evaluation of data that already makes A the 99% possibility. And that's why you pick up that almost mocking tone like, come on, what's more likely? You know, uh, a pigeon or, you know, mm-hmm. alien mm-hmm. spacecraft kind of thing. And, and he's yeah. convinced of it, right? So, but on the other hand, I will admit this. I will say that if, as we know, as I strongly believe there is there is a here here, right? There, There's something going on. Um, then eventually those people who would want to deny will play their role too, because they're the ones that will sometimes take the time to analyze to the nth degree, to put forward every other possibility until like Sherlock Holmes says, if only one possibility remains, no matter how outlandish it is, it must be the true answer. So they play a role in that sense. And I do think even the Mick West of the world can sometimes play a role in helping us to not fall into the, the, um, erroneous assumption that every believer story that comes forward or every strange anomaly seen in the sky is an actual spacecraft or some sort of anomalous phenomena. Sometimes it is just atmospheric phenomena or an aircraft or not. In fact, I think those of us who've looked at this data for a long time would say that like 98% of the time, that's going to be one of the things. And I think we have to be careful not to uh, develop our own bias when we're around a community that knows so much of this is real to start thinking it's like everywhere all the time. That's not the case. And part of the reason why this is a hard sell is because most of the time it is something prosaic. But what we want to challenge the audience to here is is to be okay with both those statements. Then something can be 98% of the time prosaically explainable But there is that 2% that truly is anomalous. And people like Mick West can help us identify the 98%. And because of the rigor, one hopes, of their analysis, we're left with that 2% that cannot be explained through prosaic means. And it's that 2% that's going to eventually begin to shift the the majority perspective. Mm -hmm. I think of this as almost like an optimizing function. You know, there's... um you know, it's a trial uh, that refines what is understood. Uh, and so we, we do require uh, the sort of, I'm going to use some different terms here, but, you know, kind of the dreamers and, uh, and we also require those that are, uh, you know, the, for lack of a better term here, like the conservatives, the the, the, those that don't want to think there is anything other than what they have already understood. Um, you know, these are important human psychological qualities that, that benefit our survival and advance our knowledge and advance our understanding of what is real. Um, and there are times in our history when the dreamers have been right. And, uh, you know, they made a gamble on their dream and it ended up paying off in a very significant and profound uh, civilization changing way. Uh, And then there have been times when they have been absolutely wrong and uh, their fantasies, you know, were were harmful uh, and were rightly condemned. Uh, you know, the, the civilizations were preserved because they rejected some, some of those fantastical notions. So, you know, I think about this uh, very often, particularly in our highly kind of uh, polarized, you know, political climate, that, they're, that the value of, of both of these positions, of these sort of psychological traits, is, is inherently good. And, you know, when we, we are all going to find ourselves, you know, generally in one of those camps, uh, you know, you know, for the most part, um, hopefully we can kind of have the presence of mind to be able to transition across them and, you know, sort of value, uh, you know, all of them, but, you know, we're, we're generally going to be kind of in one side or another at any given time. And I think if we understand that and we are listening 
uh, to those that we disagree with, we can still value what they bring to the table um, because of these qualities. And so, you know, I would just challenge that, you know, for anyone that, you know, feels very strongly about where they are, and they're entering into a dialogue with someone on on this topic of UFOs or the phenomenon or high strangeness or paranormality or whatever, or any other topic that we kind of lead with a charitable position and, uh, and be willing to um, still see the value in those with whom we disagree. Um, I think if we can do that, we are going to better advance this topic. We are going to refine it in a way that is productive and not just a series of, uh, of insult hurling. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. I think it's, um, we need to move forward with, you know, holding a couple of different, um, tools at our disposal. One is, a uh, sort of a vessel of charity, like you say, um, I also think we need to have a, uh, a tool of discernment too. And what I mean by that is to not also waste our time. We don't have to be mean spirited to people, but if we sense mm-hmm. that someone really is not open to a conversation and they're using language as if they are, but really it becomes clear that they're not and they're trying to defend a position and, and coming at it with an assumptive kind of perspective that of course they have to be right and we can't be right. Um, then I think you can, in a peaceful way, without being mean-spirited, you can exit that conversation. In other words, I think we want to encourage people to be charitable, but at the same time, that doesn't mean you have to spend three hours (laughs) talking with someone who's just going to debunk till the cows come home, no matter what you show them and no matter what evidence that exists. Some people are not honest brokers. That that's the case too. So uh, again, we can we don't have to be mean spirited toward those, those people, but I think we want to choose to have productive conversations. Um, I would also say that evolution is always messy. You know, when we uh, not just with a phenomenon, but any kind of um, period that a society goes through, you always have those that are trying to push for change, those that are kind of in the middle, going, "We've got it mostly right." And those holding up the tail saying, we're veering way off course. We got to stick with what used to be true, you know, and always should be true. And yes, like you said, each of those plays a role and each um, creates a certain uh, play, almost like a safety valve in the system, you know, to prevent galloping into something that could be a big mistake. You just like we have different personalities that play different roles and each is valuable in the same way, each of these positions plays a role. Um, I think also if you run into someone who starts getting almost aggressive in their, again, their assumption that a flatland kind of materialist point of view rules the day and therefore there's no way some of the stuff can be true, I would see if they're open to examining that perspective. So, um, because again, if someone's coming from that perspective already, then no amount of data you can show them is going to change their mind. So you can, again, see, uh, you know, pragmatically, diplomatically, if you could shift the perspective, make shift the conversation into that. But if not, then I would, again, I would encourage people to gracefully exit the conversation. So, um, I think all of us have to, in the midst of this messiness, that is the evolutionary process. Um, we each have to think about how we can make our time most valuable and, and, uh, take care of ourselves as well, you know? And, um, I think we also have to recognize that for those of us who are kind of on the cutting edge, those of us who have seen what's coming that the, the majority has not yet seen yet, it's going to be a bit of a lonely feeling and you, you have to just become comfortable with some degree of dis- with, with some degree of discomfort you know and that sounds almost uh, you know paradoxical but I think what I'm saying is if like we've talked about when you've been through evolved through several different worldviews where you really shifted your perspective on what is real what that entails then hopefully you hold it more lightly you also don't judge too harshly those who are not there yet because you know that you once weren't there either. That's what we're partly trying to say here is that even in our lives, we've 
held different positions that we wouldn't hold now, what good does it do to judge those who are in that position when we ourselves were there at one point? And, and you know, judgment and scorn wouldn't have changed us. Mm. So it's not going to change them either. So you always still have to approach these people with, uh, you know, a, a gracious attitude. Um, but again, I think it is important to sort of wield the tool of, uh, of discernment too, and, and try to see where people really coming at this from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I want to tie this into kind of the phenomenon itself and uh, what this experience, you know, kind of these insights that we've talked about, you know, what of those might we map onto the phenomenon itself? You know, so what um, I, I think of... Uh, the notion of looking back at, at, at my past selves, you know, sort of decades ago or years ago, you know, there's a different Nathan kind of at each slice of, of time and, and observing those different, uh, you know, sort of instantiations of myself, you know, I can see represented there. So these different, you know, kind of viewpoints, these different uh, camps more so than others. And that awareness, that that ability to uh, observe, you know, kind of the, the the journeys that I myself have gone through, you know, I wonder if the phenomenon itself, and by that I guess I want to say, you know, any other intelligence that may be out there, you know, it too must also have gone through these kinds of periods, that it too, uh, you know, may have some kind of awareness. Of, of these levels, uh, of these ways of relating to uh, reality. And because of that, uh, you know, kind of what I would guess call wisdom, perhaps, you know, that that that, that is part of, uh, is going to play a part in the way in which it relates with us, uh, just as we relate with it. And I, I wonder to what degree you've considered, you know, kind of that, you know, because we often kind of talk about the phenomenon, I think, in a pretty flat way, you know, it's 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 um, it's if like the you know, you when you read about stories about alien encounters or whatever, they seem, you know, pretty uh, monolithic or you know, you know, kind of two dimensional almost in their quality. Um, we we also sort of think that when they show up, it's like here's information and we're done, you know, like we're, we've got there, we're it's over. Um, and so not recognizing the sort of very real dynamic process that is at play both now and whenever that sort of new sort of change moment occurs. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that a lot of people have a hard time coming to grips with and acknowledging the amount of developmental differences and different worldviews that coexist in our world, in our civilization at the same time. Um, and like you said, we have this tendency, which I also, uh, it, you know, it puts up a red flag for me when I see these monolithic um, representations of the phenomenon or different groups within the phenomenon. In the same way that we're saying right now, that there's a certain center of gravity as, a, as, a ter- as an expression that's used in integral circles that say you have, it, for instance, in American culture, you have three main developmental levels coexisting right now that see the world very differently. And that's partly what leads to the cultural wars we're going through right now and the the divide in the populace. But the center of gravity is kind of like the average of all of those, right? So you can find an average out of the entire populace. Um, But in the same way, while we may, when we encounter these others may find our center of gravity, they too might very well likely have a range just like we Mm -hmm. do. And, Um, one of the things that I've become pretty convinced of is that this never becomes, you never arrive at a static point, right? That new perspectives, new worldviews, greater conceptions of what's available in reality, that's an emergent process. So even though, so for instance, say with spiral dynamics and integral theory, we can sort of picture what's coming two, three levels ahead of us, right? Mm -hmm. After that, we can't see any further. That doesn't mean there isn't something that will come. There will be. There always has been. 
It's just that we don't have the capacity yet to see it. So the point there is that even these, even if some of these others are highly advanced, they too will still be moving along a spectrum that never ends. It's part of the, from my point of view, it's sort of like the uh, the teleological principle of the cosmos that's mm. moving it towards uh, some direction. There's a trajectory involved there. And they are subject to that just like we are. So mm. I, like you, um, am hesitant to accept those, those views. And um, I think that that's where you and I, for instance, in that case, are trying to apply some healthy skepticism, right? We're saying, mm -hmm. we don't want to disbelieve you when you say these certain others are love and light and nothing but, and these ones over here are deceptive and dark and, and eat our negative energy for lunch and <laughs> nothing makes them happier. Mm -hmm. The reason why we're skeptical about that is based on life experience and based on our own experience of sentient beings that we've been around our entire lives. And if it's not the case there, then why suddenly is it different with these others? And, and, and to what degree are we projecting our desire for something static and something clean and clear more so than it really being that way? Uh, I think it, it is, that's a perfect example of where healthy skepticism is completely uh, valid. Yeah. And the phrase that comes to mind is, you know, we've been asking, you know, are, are we ready for them? You know, are we ready? You know, is, is the earth ready for, for this knowledge? You know, it's very us centered. Are we going to be okay with this? And maybe the other question is, are they ready for us? <laughs> you know, are they ready <laughs> for for having us be a part of much more a part of, of their paradigm than we are now. Uh, you know, our, our greater awareness of their existence will change that dynamic. It will change them as much as it changes us. And so, you know, in, in time, there is a, perhaps a, a method to the madness there uh, that, that it, it requires uh, you know, some sort of um, appropriateness, you know, that, 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 that we both need, we are both, ha we are both being prepared, if you think of it that way, uh, for this new way of, of, of relating with, 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 with each other. I think it's, um, a, and that's, that's a never talked point. about. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think it's not nearly considered enough, you know, and, and when you look at the, the arguable uptick that we saw after the detonation of the first atomic bombs, for instance, they may have reluctantly decided they better engage with us because we have now reached a certain technological level, uh, which is kind of not congruent with our consciousness level, where we suddenly become, rather than this tribal society, you know, beating each other with clubs, we now can do real damage maybe not even to just to the earth environment, but maybe into, into shadow biomes that may exist or even alternate, alternate dimensions, right? And so just like we think about like a, a, a nation like China going from a pre-industrial, very poor country to suddenly in a few decades time becoming a world superpower, basically, we, we have to engage with them, right? We, we don't have any other choice. So it is very interesting, as you sort of suggest there, to put yourself in their shoes, that we may be that to them, that they've already been in this cosmic neighborhood and we've kind of been an afterthought up until now. But now because of our progress, and again, I would suggest you maybe can argue that this is the case based on how there has been an uptick since the dawn of the atomic age, that, that they now have to wrestle with, okay, they've reached this point. And maybe even they've seen other civilizations like us in the past blow themselves up, not make it through because of that incongruence between level of consciousness and level of technological capacity to destroy yourselves. Uh, so that is an interesting uh, discussion. And, and as we've talked about before, we do need to remember that this is not going to be one aha moment, even if we do get public recognition that they're here. That's day one of an acknowledged relationship, right? And so mm -hmm. you think about the complexity of international dynamics, right? Geopolitical dynamics, when nations have no choice but to begin to uh, dialogue with each other, even if they have very different worldviews, very different cultural fabric. Now imagine completely different species, right? Maybe even mm -hmm. a different
different way of experiencing reality, the space-time fabric itself. That is day one at that point. And, and that's why I think we should not be looking to one glorious day where suddenly all our dreams are realized that no matter what happens, this is going to be an ongoing process for the rest of our lives. Definitely. And, and two, maybe we need to be willing to uh, see that that intelligence, as we have, I think, often uh, presumed, uh, is not, um, you know, kind of like a, like a, like a grand computer, you know, that, 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 that because they are more intelligent, they are, they're functioning as if they are a computer that has perfect knowledge of some kind, you know, that maybe the hallmark of intelligence is these different ways of, uh, relating to, uh, experience and reality such that they themselves will go through, and, and very much have periods of belief and skepticism and denial about, <laughs> about what they experience. You know, let, let us not be too quick to uh, ascribe uh, to, to them, you know, a, a, a character trait or quality that is, uh, you know, so cold and calculating as a machine. And I feel like that we often do that, uh, you know, because of the correlates that we have for, uh, you know, intelligence or processing power, you know, it's all through com computation. And we, we really kind of take that and we just, we, we apply that pretty, I think, flippantly uh, to uh, aspects of the phenomenon as if they're going to be these, you know, uh, sophisticated uh, computers. Um, they very, very well may have many of the same qualities that we do. And, and maybe that will be something well worth celebrating. Right. And, and we should also distinguish between, you know, technological sophistication and actual developmental level, right? And hmm. one does not necessarily imply the other. And I, I see people making that mistake too, of assuming, well, since they can run circles around us in terms of our craft versus their craft, they must be our moral superiors to the nth degree. And so please come and save us. You know, we mm -hmm. ascribe a sort of savior role to them, which again, based on what we've talked about today, even at a relatively advanced place in a societal's progress, when you compare us to say the Middle Ages or something or primitive man, there still is a, a sometimes really uh, kind of nasty mix of different developmental levels. It's always messy. Um, it does become more peaceful over time in general, but there's still that combustible mix. That's that's actually mm. part that's built into evolution, that that's actually what helps move it forward. So I agree that we, we should uh, look to that for them, uh, from them, that they would also be going through that. And again, I think part of the challenge here is because the mainstream doesn't acknowledge this phenomenon and because the data is sometimes ambiguous, I mean, how many different narratives have we heard around the graves? I mean, there's so many from their... Mm total evil to their, you know, angelic to their mm -hmm. something in Robots. between, right? Mm -hmm. um, that sometimes in that void, it's very easy for us to ascribe whatever qualities we want because we don't have to prove it because the mainstream is not paying attention anyway. And this is again where the, the skeptics and whatnot can help us and how we can adopt a skeptical attitude in terms of saying, um, you know, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not make the mistake of ascribing qualities to them that is not evidenced in the data. And what I come away with when I look at the um, the ambiguity around the ultimate nature of these and, and what their purpose is and their agenda, I, I take a position uh, like a conservative reserve is kind of what I come away. I, I, I'm not mm. ready to make a strong commitment Either way, because I, I first want to reconcile why do we have so many different narratives here? There's different ways mm -hmm. that could be explained, but I'm okay not knowing exactly. And, and that that's that's something we want to encourage people to is that it's fine to have strong belief based on evidence, but it's also completely legitimate and justifiable and even appropriate to say, right now there's some ambiguity around that data. We know something's going on, but we can't, maybe we don't have the capacity or whatever but let's hold off on trying to put a bow on that, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, we hope that, um, 
uh, our listeners have you know kind of gained something from this conversation that you know that, that at least it's challenged uh, you know some of the ways in which you approach this topic. I know it it's absolutely helped me uh, to be able to talk about these different ways of approaching information and and uh, you know and the, and the truth that I understand. Um, you know, and I think it again. These are tools. Uh, these are frameworks that we are trying to uh, work through ourselves uh, for hopefully in the service of um, better preparing us, you know, for whatever may come uh, that um, we will be in a position to uh, you know, deal with any kind of new truth, new revelation in a way that is healthy, uh, that is um, wise, if you will. And, uh, and to that end, I would say, you know, this, this happens through conversation. You know, this, this doesn't happen uh, in a vacuum, you know, that, um, you know, that, that just as our dialogues, you know, absolutely add value to uh, my way of understanding the, the, this topic, I'm hoping that uh, conversations with our listeners uh, will do the same. You know, we, we uh, very much look forward to reading uh, the feedback that we receive uh, we are planning uh, to eventually incorporate a whole uh, show uh, sort of wrapped around uh, specific listener questions and topics. Um, so if you do have something that you would really like us to tackle uh, in depth, uh, we welcome that suggestion. And, uh, you know, you can do that a, a number of ways. Uh, you can leave us a comment on uh, YouTube uh, where you can find uh, these episodes uh, on the uh, Exo Academian YouTube channel. Uh, you can send us messages on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Awave Soul. Uh, Exo is at Exo Academian. Uh, and then similarly, you can uh, interact and you should interact with Exo's uh, excellent podcast, uh, The Point of Convergence, uh, and then my show as well, Calling All Beings. So there's a lot of different ways you can find us uh, out there in a uh, you know, sort of virtual space. And we welcome those interactions because they really do inform uh, our own positions and help us when we kind of plan out where we want to go with this show, uh, the things that we're going to cover. Um, and so with that, I think we will close uh, episode five. Thank you so much for joining us. May the quality of our questions shaped by a desire for understanding enhance our journey of discovery. And may our travels broaden the sphere of our consciousness, reminding us that new discoveries beget new horizons. As always, adventure awaits. We'll see you next time on Liminal Frames. <laughs>